So some of you may be wondering what I'm doing up here again, because when I was in here this morning, I was talking about the ITER project, uh, a giant 35 country public collaboration to bring fusion energy to reality. This is a very different topic. This is a, this is a arguably a startup, uh, depending on how you define startup that I'm involved in, um, which is uh, Cloak. So we, when you talk about being a startup and trying to figure out, are you a startup, are you not? You usually start with something like, there's a problem I want to solve, or there's just a great invention I've done, or I want to ma make a bunch of money. And in some cases, it's, it's all three of those. In this particular case, we saw the need for a fundamental change in, at the beginning, consumer privacy. And we saw a whole list of impossible challenges and little tweaks that weren't really solving the system. So what are those challenges? First of all, cybersecurity largely is an entrenched system. I will make the argument to you in a moment that we've been doing the same basic things for about uh, either since medieval times or even going back about 4,000 years. Really, I explained that. Um, secondly, the privacy and security aspects are very, very much interlinked. Thirdly, you have arguably laws that are impossible to actually do technologically. I would argue that GDPR, while a lot of companies try to comply, is still not really like the, the ability to ensure the right to be forgotten to the consumer, et cetera, is, is still not really possible. That's why when we go on the internet in the last two, three years, we're just constantly clicking, clicking, I accept, I accept, I accept, even though we've been on that same website the previous week. So why is that? Um, a lot of it has to do with control after disclosure. We were told, as we started this out, that it would be impossible to control data after disclosing it. That sounds pretty logical, right? We saw that as an impossible challenge to be solved. And then connected to that, is the idea that the consumer has become the product. That's very familiar to you, but back when we were starting this, it was still just emerging that you as a consumer, so we've got you know, Lewis here, you know him as Comedy Lewis, right? But there is a, there is a Lewis uh, Zazeneron, I think is his last name. There is a digital form of him out there in the universe. It may not look coherent, it may not be an avatar that comes on stage and can do comedy, but there are the medical records, the financial records, the, um, the, the email that he's doing, who he's working with, how his iPhone connects with somebody else's in proximity. All that data is out there. Every one of you has a digital self. And corporate profits are very much tied to that. So that became a second, how do you, how do you overturn a system that has corporate profit directly tied into it, right? And then last two challenges were that it's getting bigger because we're heading toward a metaverse where whatever the digital self is that you have now is just going to get more and more and more and more ubiquitous. And uh, finally, that this is a very fortunate challenge, but it's the worst one, it's failing. Look at any sort of, I mean, we all see this, most of us kind of ignore it. I think for, for corporations, for companies, we know that this is a real, a real problem, that, that we see ransomware rising. It went down a little bit during COVID and then it started rising. We see, um, quantum computing coming, which will allow brute force attacks that really, really, if you look at the intelligence committees in the European Commission and other governments, you will see that they're saying it's an impossible problem to solve. Yeah, so, so all of the different sort of cyber attacks that are just getting more and more ubiquitous. Go back to the first one, entrenched system. So if you were to draw a line uh, of, of how we've been attacking the difference between the, those who are protecting data and those who are trying to hack in and, and spy on that data, you could draw a pretty unbroken graph from the tombs of the pharaohs. If you go back to the tomb of Amenhotep, you will see in hieroglyphs character substitution. That's basically what encryption still is. In the digital age, it's become always mathematical. That means that when you send something, a file that's encrypted, end-to-end -end encryption, sure, it's encrypted, but if somebody can break it, it is, all the data is there, it's all present. So that means that there is always a mathematical way, however difficult, to, to unravel that. That means that when you look at, at various governments that are downloading terabytes of data today that they cannot, they cannot actually read, it's because they believe that with the advent of quantum computing, they're gonna be able to go back in and break all that out because it's just a, math, it's a mathematical challenge, right? So, um, how do you take those kinds of problems and make a solution? The 
summary of it for me is that we want to restore control. That is how we summarize all of that. We want to give the consumer control over their own data, and we want to give companies the control over their own data. So how do we do that? If you, I, I want to spend a little time looking at the current solutions and then what we do differently. So right now, the average chief information security officer has about between 55 and 75 uh, security products. And you can see most of them are in the identify and protect and, de de uh, protect and detect. There's an increasing, because of, of ransomware, there's an increasing move toward companies that will go into response and recover. OK, fine. But if you look at this, I, uh, I live in the south of France, and we see lots of these, these castles, and they're, they're uh, also around a lot of the European landscape. The medieval strategy is to build a wall. And I would argue that fundamentally that has just stuck in our brains so much that we're still back to thinking about walls when we think about how to protect. So the term that's out there in vogue, if you look at the US, the Biden administration has put a ton of money mandating zero trust architecture. But look at that zero trust architecture in relation to the medieval wall and tell me what has changed. This is their illustration. You've got a presidential motorcade, right? And so you've got a barrier out there, the wall. You've got a few people outside the wall that are infiltrating, trying to make sure, looking at as one of the enemy is coming. You have the row of guards, then you have uh, the security officers walking beside, you have the cars before and be front, and you have the, the uh, bulletproof car. What does that tell you? It tells you exactly where the important thing is. So much of what we're doing now serves to say, here's the data. You can't get to it, we're gonna try to prevent you, but here is where the data is. Calling attention to exactly the important thing, and the weird thing about it is if you look at most of the most innovative hacks over the last few years, the intruder, the attacker, was already inside the car. It's insider malware, things that are being trusted and so forth. So how is it possible to solve that? Coming back to this, we've tended to encircle it with a bunch of other walls. Again, uh, devices, apps, networks, data, and users. And so going back to this thing about the, the normal chief information security officer, most of them, over half, are not confident that actually, even with all of this, they're solving the problem. So if history shows us the flaws, what does it show us about solutions? In the 1940s, when the Nazi armies were coming through Europe, and uh, one of the things that they did as sort of a hobby was to also steal a bunch of art. And there was a French priest, it's a very, very unique story about a French priest who learned by a, by a, a horse rider coming and warning the villagers that one of the things they were stealing was these, were these famous, very, very precious stained glass windows. And the priest said, I'm gonna do something different, piece of innovation. He took the windows down, he took every piece of stained glass out, and he gave it to a different parishioner. That's our model. So think about that in terms of data. The data, if somebody had a piece of glass completely out of context, not in a frame, in their drawer somewhere or a closet at home, it was without value. And the frame, without any of the data, was also without value. So how do we translate that to a new architecture? This is the architecture I've been talking about so far. This is basic encryption and firewalls and so forth. And, and there are enough standards in place that we still do that. But we replace the data that is traveling through the internet or the data that is publicly representable with a token. This is very much like your license plate works, right? You've got a license plate right now on your car that represents a ton of confidential data. You would, your driving record, all sorts of things that you would not want public, but you trust that because nobody can go to that license plate and mathematically derive the data, and the people who do have access generally, not always, but you, you trust that those people will handle your license plate data responsibly. So then we put a huge emphasis on authentication. Um, this is something that can actually be done in our model any way you want to. We recommend a biometric that is based on how you type. So I can hand Lewis my, my username and password, and it will come in and he, it'll say, no, you're not him, you're not Laban, right? So um, that's, that's a biometric that we, that we advocate. But in reality, our system allows you to add, say, a GPS filter. You can add a, a, a time filter. You can say, this data is so sensitive, it can only be accessed by this person typing on Tuesday's Central European time between 10 and 11 uh, within three meters of this desk. So you can put as much control there as you want. But here's the real key, which is the stained glass window. We fragment the data, 
and we disperse it into micro vaults so that if you go into the micro vault, you may pull up something and says, this is a two. But is that two a healthcare number? Is it an address? What, what is it? Or is it encrypted? It's actually supposed to be a G or something like that. So you, even if the vault is hacked, there is no identifiable ownership of the data, and only the token knows how to put it together, and the token will only do that for the authorized user. Some of you may, who are in cybersecurity may know this as sharding. It is very similar, but the trade secrets that we've got don't, uh, don't actually lend it to that. Now, that is represented in, uh, in uh, one of our original patents, and in fact, if you look at our patent um, portfolio, we've got about 10, um, which is weird because people like cybersecurity and software in general to be open source. However, um, we know that there are companies that are, that are violating our patents. We know that. We, about uh, seven months after our first patent was issued, uh, MasterCard and Visa and American Express started to use something suspiciously similar in the way that they protected credit card transactions, which benefits all of you who use your, your uh, debit card, credit card. That's all using uh, an element, an, a, a single element out of our overall architecture. But what we recognized, again, think metaverse as the challenge. We recognized that somehow we had to get to a point where this could apply to everything. So we started developing this for communication, for creation. How can we protect songwriters? How can we protect after NFTs come out and they're still subject to theft? How can we protect NFTs? How can we protect a crypto wallet? So as the, as the metaverse takes your digital self and becomes much, much, much more um, ubiquitous, how can we ensure that each person has the control of their own data and each corporation, each company has control of their own data? And you can see, you know, IBM, eBay, Alcatel, JP Morgan, th this list of companies that has cited our patents is in itself a bit of validation. But we also recognize because the system, my first challenge said the system is extremely entrenched. Our logic comes from the medieval walls and our, our behavior of character substitution comes from a 4,000 year tradition. That to change this, something so fundamental is going to require a radical approach to validation. So our go to market strategy, you would expect after hearing that we can do all these things that it should look something like this. We offer a comprehensive array of data solutions for databases communication, uh, hard drives, office, it's, et cetera. The trust refers to um, the idea of a person who can have their individual medical, legal, financial, et cetera, uh, information in their own cloaked trust. It's a concept being put forward by Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web at, uh, at MIT. But actually, no. We said this is not what we want to do. Because as a startup, you know, many of you certainly here, know that the challenges for every startup are a complete labyrinth of things to navigate from seed to series A, series B, et cetera. And we recognized that was never going to work for us. So we developed a, an approach, which is a bit radical. Most of the people that I met with, personal friends, just told me this is nuts, it's never going to work. It's actually working, um, quite surprisingly. And what that basically does is that we are looking to partner with um, Fortune 50 companies who already have their own um, IT software development group, they have their own customer database, they will handle product sales, et cetera. We simply do letters of intent and joint ventures with each of them. We have those lined up in uh, the corporate area, in the consumer area, in the, and the corporate is, is not just corporate, it's also sales to governments, uh, government agencies, et cetera, where the need is there. The third area we may take on is our own product control, which is protecting uh, creation. So an artist's artwork, a digital artwork, a uh, the song, as I mentioned, the NFTs, all that kind of thing. And that's generally uh, where we fit. But that's, that's essentially how we're leapfrogging. Um, and I think that brings us to uh, the closing slide. We've, we've, we've worked on R&D for about, for more than 10 years actually, um, because we wanted to be sure this would work across the whole system as we were watching others starting to use our concepts. And so the, the final characteristics, I mentioned radical validation, and universal need, we also ensured that it would be augmentative, meaning it is not tear down your existing system and rebuild. The way that we've developed the, the approach is that it will overlay on existing systems to minimize cost, et cetera, to users. So that brings an end to my talk, and I'm happy to take a question. All right, Laban, thank you very much. Round of applause, sir. Thank you. Uh, okay, your... 
the end of the slide, the presentation, where you're talking about your go-to-market strategy and that you're not going to, if I understood correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're not going to build your own products around that. You're essentially going to license your tech so it's used in other industry products. Is that Sort right? of, yeah. We, I mean, the, the truth is that software, hardware, this is a universal market. Um, we will not initially do that. We will, pre we, will, we will start with partnering with large existing companies who, are, who have the reputation, the infrastructure, et cetera, to do that on their own. And then there are some product lines we'll launch ourselves, but initially not our own product. Oh, okay, so let's say there's a database vendor, I don't know, Adam, yeah. nowhere, whatever, unnamed database vendor, you might work with them. Uh, so yeah. underneath the surface, their product that they yeah. sell to their customers might include your technology. So on that area, it, we're talking to people like BlackRock, Ernst & Young, PricewaterhouseCooper, Iron Mountain. It's that level of corporation that is showing interest. All right. Uh, I had actually, there's a good one here on the, the question panel, which I wanted to ask myself. Wait, wait, you said, You've got patents, but you know that like Visa and MasterCard <laughs> are violating them, and you're like, yeah. oh yeah, but we don't care. Like, what? You got patents, but you don't care? Someone's ripping them off? I know, it sounds very strange. Um, we have on our advisory group, and he's an investor as well, um, a patent troll, one of the top patent trolls in the US, now living in Paris. It drives him nuts that we do this, because he would like to go after them and, and, and so forth. And he did a lot of the work to map out how we would do that. We chose not to do it, because in the area of software, open source is really sort of the way to go. We're not at the point of going open source yet. We simply want to be able to control when we're ready. Okay. So they may eventually become a partner, okay. but we don't want to be, again, we're trying to solve a global problem. We see something that is going to be, we started with wanting to protect privacy. MasterCard, Visa, and American Express with all of your debit and credit cards, they're actually doing that. They're protecting privacy. So we don't want to detract from that. We don't want to take it away. All right, pick your time. Pick the battle, pick exactly. the correct time. Exactly. Who's the partner, who's not the partner. I see where we're going with this. All right, one more round of applause for Laban. Thank you, sir. I should, oh, yeah. I should say one more thing I forgot to say. The reason I was coming to Estonia was actually for ITER, but the more that I read about Estonia, I've been reading about this environment for quite a lot of years, so if there are people out here who agree with my conclusion and what has been said multiple times, that this is one of the best places in the world for a startup. As we're coming into Europe, I'd be happy to talk to anybody who's, who's interested in that. We're not looking for investors, nothing like that, just a, a sort of a home. So thank you.